Hello and welcome to the Ministry of the Real Truth. We are going to do something different and look at the Holy Bible from the Ancient Eastern Text, George M. Lampson's translation of from the Aramaic of the Eastern Peshitta. We have a little bit of information about George Lamsa, supposedly born in Syria, an Aramaic speaker, but who translated the Peshitta and didn't agree with the Triune or the Trinity, so he left it out. We will have to do more personal research and verify that as an established fact by bringing the evidence to verify that. Preface the favorable or favorable reception according according to Lamps the translation of the Gospels later of the New Testament and of the Psalms has prompted these authors to publish a complete translation of the Holy Bible from the Peshitta, the authorized Bible of the Church of the East. So that would be the Eastern, the Syriac Eastern Peshitta, not the Western Peshitto. That's the impression we get from that information. This translation of the Old and New Testaments into English is based on Peshitta manuscripts which have comprom comprised the accepted Bible of all of those Christians who have used Syriac as their language of prayer and worship for many centuries. It is appropriate that as we have translations based on the Greek Septuagint or the L double X of the Old Testament and on the Latin Bible of Jerome. So also should there be available to the modern reader that form of the text which was translated anciently into a branch of the Aramaic language which has been used by Christians from earliest times. In the long history of the Aramaic language there are three periods of special interest to us. From the 6th to the 4th century before Christ it was a language of empire extending from the borders of Persia to those of Europe and down the Nile through the length of Egypt. It was in those days spoken and written by the Jewish people at least equally with Hebrew. And so we have parts of Ezra and Daniel and one verse in Jeremiah 10, 11, that were composed in Aramaic and preserved in that ancient form of the language in the midst of the Hebrew Old Testament. In the first century, Jesus and his earliest followers certainly spoke Aramaic for the most part, although they also knew Hebrew. Therefore, the gospel message was first preached in the Aramaic of the Jews of Palestine. Modern scholarship tells us that the originals of the four gospels and of other parts of the New Testament were written in Greek. This is disputed by the Church of the East and by some noted Western scholars, regardless of which view one may accept. Aramaic speech is an underlying factor, and it is unquestionably true that documents written in Aramaic were drawn on by writers of the New Testament the basic inspired form of the Christian message. Aramaic was the language of the church that spread east almost from the beginning of Christianity from Antioch and Jerusalem beyond the confines of the Roman Empire. This differed from the language of Palestine in choice of words and grammatical forms rather more extensively than does American English. From British English and in written forms these differences became regular and standardised. The Jews and Christians used the literary dialect of Aramaic that we call Syriac almost at the same time to propagate their translations of the sacred books brought from Palestine and the West, reaching into Syria and Mesopotamia and the nearby mountains quite early into India and into China in the course of time. Modern scholarship believes that, as happened in other parts of the church, the earliest copies of the sacred books in Syriac were revised again and again to bring them closer to the standard of the Hebrew and Greek texts from which they were drawn. 
This view too is not accepted by the Church of the East. Under any conditions by the 5th century AD, the Peshitta version in its present form held a field by universal acclaim. So yeah, what would be the point if it was written in their language, they spoke that language, therefore they knew it, their mass or the people that attended their mass, their church, being natives, also understood that language. So they spoke to them in that language, so why the heck would they need to translate it into any other language or revise it, etc., etc., et if they're the original uh, Eastern Syriac text or the Peshitta? As stated by the native born Aramaic speaking translator Victor N. Alexander from Betnaran or Mesopotamia, Syria and the patriarchs, right, if it's all in the originally written in their language, they understand it, maybe they don't use the old dead language, the original language anymore, but they have a modern vernacular that they use in their liturgy. So, why would they? bother to have it translated into Greek Latin or whatever again where they could just read it to the people who understood that language using that modern vernacular or that new vernacular or derivative the fixed stand of the Church of the East with respect to some of the points mentioned above can or beforehand can best be understood by reference to the following letter which these translators or these authors are authorised to quote from the patriarch and head of their church Patriarch Kate of the East Modesto, California April 5th, 1957 with reference to your letter concerning Lamps' translation of the Aramaic Bible and the originality of the Peshitta text as the patriarch and head of the Holy Apostolic and Catholic Church of the East we wish to state that the Church of the East received the scriptures from the hands of the blessed apostles themselves in the Aramaic original, the language spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and that the Peshitta is the text of the Church of the East, which has come down from the biblical times without any change or revision. In other words, it was intact, it was never messed with. And this is what was up on Andrew Gabriel Roth, the translator of this uh, Aramaic Syriac Eastern Peshitta at his website the aramaxscriptures.com but for some reason it was taken down but you could find it in one of his PDFs right, one of his ebooks and yes it was Ma Ishai Shimon by Grace Kafalokos Patriarch of the East he was the Patriarch in 1957 of that church but he was assassinated in 1975 by a Kurd From the Mediterranean East into India, the Peshitta is still the Bible of preference among Christians, though today nearly all who use it speak Arabic, or one of the tongues of South, in South India. Yeah, I talked to um, some protesters here about the um, Al-Qaeda or whoever marching into their towns in Syria and then kicking them out of the houses and stuff like that and then insulting the Christ etc etc like that we don't really believe that that's what they were that they were Islamic because uh, Muslims revere Christ as the prophet not the son of God or the Messiah but a prophet and the like uh, another prophet like Muhammad right in the lines of Muhammad so I don't believe that these people were actually some extreme uh Muslim faction they're probably someone else pretending to be right because they have the usual face coverings all that sort of stuff um, but we'll keep that particular name of who we believe it possibly was to ourselves if you want to know who it was then go to your own personal research on that look at the uh, old news footage of when these people supposedly entered the land and kicked these Syrians out of their houses etc etc From the Mediterranean East into India, the Peshitta is still the Bible of preference among Christians, though today nearly all who use it speak Arabic, or one of the tongues of South India. Yeah, the, as we said, the uh, protest, the Syrian guy we talked to, said, yeah, they use uh, Aramaic, this liturgy, 
uh, plus they also use Arabic in their mass so uh, or one of the tongues of South India west of the Euphrates spoken Aramaic as the mother tongue survives today only in two mountain villages northwest of Damascus differing as much from the speech of Jesus they have reached from its parent Latin east of the Euphrates in the Kurdish mountains and near Lake Umia perhaps it Perhaps a hundred thousand people, Christian, Jew, and Muslim, speak another form of it, strangely mixed with borrowing words from the various languages of their polyglot neighbours, but still basically akin to the Aramaic Syriac of olden times. George M. Lamser, B. A. F. R. S. A., the translator of this work, is uniquely fitted for the task to which he has devoted the major parts part of his life. He is an Assyrian and a native of ancient biblical lands, where he lived until World War One. Like most, they end up migrating to America or somewhere else. Until that time, isolated from the rest of Christendom, his people retained biblical customs and Semitic culture which had perished everywhere else. This background, together with his knowledge of the Aramaic Syriac language, has enabled him to recover much of the meaning that has been lost in other translations of the scriptures. But like others that translated it, apparently, according to Victor Alexander, they botched it especially like the uh, American missionaries that came in and tried to create a uh, Syriac grammar so that they could translate and then preach the King James Version to these people in Urmia. They botched it. This background, together with his knowledge of the Aramaic, the Syriac language, has enabled him to recover much of the meaning that has been lost in other translations of the scriptures. Here we did but... Um, Comparisons have been ha- have been had with Peshitta manuscripts in the Morgan Library, New York, New York, NY, USA, with manuscripts in the Freer Collection, Washington D.C., with the Uramia edition, and with a manuscript of the Peshitta Old Testament in the British Museum, the oldest dated biblical manuscript in existence. Our translator states that comparisons show no differences in text between these various manuscripts, and that he has filled in the few missing portions of chronicles from other authentic Peshitta sources is noted in his introduction well there's one better um, the Aramaic speaking translator Victor E. Alexander who actually found a way to uh, translate the original old language dead language of the hidden and preserved manuscripts of the Church of the East and discovered because he knows many dialects of Aramaic we're pretty sure he said he discovered that it was Ninevite Aramaic the Aramaic that Jonah spoke the only way he could translate this old dead language that nobody ever uses anymore is um, through using the modern vernacular root words and so forth so these authors hope that this translation will be of aid to Bible readers as students in obtaining a more thorough and complete understanding of the scriptures. The publisher. Introduction. North of the Garden of Eden in the basin of the river Tigris in the mountain fastnesses of what is known today as Kurdistan, there lived an ancient people, the descendants of the Assyrians, the founders of the great Assyrian Empire and culture in Bible days, the originators of the alphabet and many sciences which contributed so generously to the Semitic culture from which sprang our Bible or your modern Americanized Bible, right? These people, the Assyrians, played an important part in the history of the Near East, of the Bible, and of religion in general. When Nineveh was destroyed in 612 BC, many of the princes and noblemen of this once vast empire fled northward into the accessible, inaccessible mountains, where they remained secluded and cut off until the dawn of the 20th century. Nahum says, Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria, thy nobles shall dwell in the dust, Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. Nahum 3.18 Some descendants of the Assyrians and some of the descendants of the ten tribes who were taken captive by the Assyrian kings in 721 BC and settled in Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and other places east of the river Euphrates were among the first converts to Christianity. When Jesus sent 70 of his disciples to preach the gospel, he instructed them not to go in the way of the Gentiles or the non-Jews, 
or the foreign nations or peoples or into any of any city of the Samaritans you know, he didn't have a thing for Samaritans but to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first right meeting the ten tribes who were lost from the house of Israel so they had to go seek them out some of the descendants of these Hebrew tribes are still living in Iraq Iran and Turkey and most of them still converse in Aramaic the guy Jovovich and an Israeli Jew went all over the Middle East and found the descendants of those ten lost tribes and there were Ethiopians um, Chinese Indians and so forth and they verified through their dishes that they made and the rituals etc they were doing that they were actually Jews they must have been descendants of the house of Israel because how else would they have learned that because no one in Israel had by the sounds of it gone that far to the east and taught these people he's quite amazed so he said outrightly these people must be descendants of the house of Israel they must be who they claim to be the lost tribe of such and such the gospel was preached to the Jews first in Israel right? now those who had been dispersed by the persecutions which occurred on account of Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and even to the land of Cyprus and to Antioch preaching the world the word to none but to the Jews only Acts 11 19 so they didn't preach to anybody else the Greeks the Romans etc at that point in time in that era the Assyrians remained dormant during the Persian Greek Roman and Arab conquests being isolated and surrounded by the enemies they remained secluded throughout the centuries thus preserving the Aramaic language which was the language of the Near East and perpetuating the ancient biblical customs and manners which were common to all races and peoples in this part of the ancient world not until the Turkish reign did these isolated Assyrian tribes recognize any government or pay any taxes during the centuries of Arab and Turkish reigns the Assyrians retained their cultural independence later recognizing the sympathetic Turkish rule which permitted the continuation of their institutions and their religion under magnanimous Turks they were ruled by the patriarchs and chiefs paying a nominal tax to the Turkish government the Assyrian church or as it is known the ancient apostolic and catholic church of the east was one of the strongest Christian churches in the world and was noted for its missions in the middle east, India and China its missionaries carried the Christian gospel as far as China and Mongolia Indonesia, Japan and other parts of the world and they could probably verify as this guy falsely claims on YouTube etc that the Chinese etc are mongoloids yeah? if these people were alive they'd say what? Uh, or this guy would say oh they're Down syndrome no they'd say no they're not they don't even look like that just because they have strange eyes or whatever that's bias that's prejudice that's right out racism okay okay so the Christian gospel as far, went as far as China and Mongolia or these did Indonesian, Japan and other parts of the world not until the 14th century was this church rivaled by any other church in the world it was the most powerful branch of Christendom in the Near East Palestine, Arabia, Lebanon, Iran, India and elsewhere yeah because again on that Mongol thing Mongoloid thing there's actually two definitions okay so people should do their research on the definitions define it before they start pumping up a whole lot of garbage all the literature of this church was written in literary Aramaic the lingua franca that's like the trendy language of that time this is corroborated by Dr. J Arnold J. Toynbee in his uh, a study of history where he writes Darius the Great's account of his own acts on the rock of Behistan overhanging the empire's great northeast rod was transcribed in triplicate in three different adaptations of the cuneiform script conveying the three imperial capitals Elamite for Susa Medo-Persian for Ek Batana and Akkadian for Babylon but the winning language within this universal state was none of the three of 
three thus officially honoured. It was Aramaic with its handier alphabetic script. The sequel showed that commerce and culture may be more important than politics in making a language fortune. A language's fortune for the speakers of Aramaic were politically of no account in the Achaemenian Achaemenian Empire. The Persians used the Aramaic language because this tongue was the language of the two Semitic empires, the Empire of Assyria and the Empire of Babylon. Aramaic was so firmly established as a lingua franca, or the Chindi language at the time, that no government could dispense with its uses, its use as a vehicle of expression in a far-flung empire, especially in the western provinces. Moreover, without schools and other modern facilities, Aramaic could not be replaced by the speech of conquering nations. Conquerors were not interested in imposing their languages and cultures on subjugated peoples, or people enslaved or people under their rule, right? What they wanted was taxes, spoils and other levies. It's all about the Benjamins, baby. The transition from Aramaic, and you say, footnote down here, indication, the Greeks called it Syriac, derived from Sir or Tyre. Remember that in the Bible? The nation of Tyre? How they became um, powerful, they got a big ego and all that sort of, certain, that sort of stuff and they were warned. Right? Uh, the, the transition from Ar- Aramaic into Arabic, a sister tongue, took place place after the conquest of the Near East by the Muslim armies in the 7th century AD. Mm, sister tongue. Well, we have found um, information which says all stem from the Nabataean. It's a grandparent, it's a parent of the uh, Hebrew the Aramaic, the Syriac, and the Arabic is the child language of those parents. Right? The Syriac, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic. So I don't really agree with that there. Probably a sister language to the Syriac is probably what he means because it seems to be very close to that, the Syriac. But apparently there's some there was some door post or gate post or something in uh, Israel or some area that were found and it had this uh, Arabic up there and they said oh well it's like looks they thought it was Syriac or something it looks very very close to Syriac at that time um, okay I can't remember where we found it so I can't like verify that Okay, the transition from Aramaic into Arabic, a sister tongue. Okay, yeah, because apparently it was no longer the lingua franca for a while there. Arabic took over, uh, but supposedly Muhammad really loved the people of the book and the text, and he didn't want to see it just disappear or something like that. So he embraced all into Arabic, but he just didn't believe or didn't understand, couldn't grasp the triune so he left it out because he wanted a new religion solely for his people etc etc yeah, the transition from Aramaic into Arabic a sister tongue took place after the conquest of the Near East by the Muslim armies in the 7th century AD nevertheless Aramaic lingered for many centuries and still was spoken in Lebanon Syria Iraq and northwestern Iran as well as among the Christian Arab tribes in northern Arabia there's many dialects its alphabet was borrowed by the Hebrews. Its alphabet was borrowed by the Hebrews. Take note of that, Hebrews, Hebrew Israelites, Arabs, Iranians, and Mongols. Dr. Philip K. Hitty, noted historian and professor of Semitic languages at Princeton University, in his book, The History of the Arabs, uses the term Aramaic and Syriac interchangeably and states that Aramaic is still a living language. He says, in country places and on their farms, these dummies clung to their ancient cultural patterns and pres- preserved their native language Aramaic and Syriac in Syria and al Iraq Iranian in Persia and Coptic in Egypt and again in al Iraq and Syria the transition from one Semitic tongue the Aramaic to another the Arabic was of course easier in the out of the way places however such as Lebanon's with the preponderant Christian population the native Syriac put up a desperate fight 
and has lingered until modern times. Indeed, Syriac is still spoken in Malula and two other villages in anti Lebanon. Is that supposed to be anti like as against or is it supposed to be like in the Greek ante another Lebanon, right? With its disappearance, Aramaic has left in the colloquial Arabic unmistakable traces noticeable in vocabulary, accent and grammatical structure. Yeah, so that's verifies what we're saying that the Arabic has a very, very close similarity uh, in ways to the Syriac. It's verified there. And it goes on about the late W.A. Wigram. And then quotes Dr. Toynbee again. As a miracle of miracles, Aramaic and most of the ancient biblical customs which were common to Semitic people have survived in northern Iraq until today. Aramaic is still spoken in Iraq and in northwestern Iran by remnants of the Assyrian people and the Jews of the exile. And the literary Aramaic remains the same today as it was of yore. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, some of the Aramaic words which are still retained in all Bible versions are still used in the Aramaic language spoken today. For example, Raka Ith Patak Rabuli Lamana Shabak Thani Talitha Kumi Maran Itha Mana Kakal Dema. As we have said, the survival of the small remnant of the segment of the ancient Semitic culture was due to the isolation, tenacity, and warlike character of the Assyrian people who were living isolated. Now under the Parthian Empire, now under the Persian Empire, now under the Arab Arabian Empire and now under the Turkish Empire. And because of this isolation, these ancient Christians had hardly any contact with Christians in the West, Romanized Christians or whoever, Latinized Christians. Only one of their bishops and a deacon participated in the Nicene Council in 325 AD. I wonder who that was. After the conversion of Emperor Constantine to Christianity in 318 AD, Christians in the Persian Empire who hitherto had been tolerated and looked upon as the enemies of Rome, yeah, because they didn't fall under their... Roman Christianity, their state Christianity, right? So they got persecuted and all that for it. Heretics, called heretics, and attacked, ridiculed, killed, martyred, etc. The persecutor of Christianity, Rome, the persecutor of Christianity, that form of Christianity, because yeah, they weren't conforming to their form. Now we're looked upon as the friends of the Church Christian Empire, Constantine, and the enemies of the Persian government. Persecutions of these Christians did not begin until the 4th century AD and lasted until the Arab conquest of Persia, 632 AD. This is why this ancient church was unable to establish contacts with Western Christianity. The scriptures in the Church of the East from the inception of Christianity to the present day are in Aramaic and have never been tampered with. There you go. As the uh, former statement of the uh, then patriarch in 1957, Maisai Shimon, testified to it's latent it's intact uh, sorry it's intact it's never been messed with okay it's never been tampered with or revised as attested by the present patriarch of the church of the east the biblical manuscripts were carefully and zealously handed down from one generation to another and kept in the massive stone walls of the ancient churches and in caves they were written on parchment and many of them survived to the present day when these texts were copied by expert scribes, they were carefully examined for accuracy before they were dedicated and permitted to be read in churches. So would that be like those Hebrew rabbis, etc., etc., the scribes as much of the um, Judaism and stuff? Even one missing letter would render the text void. The same sort of attitude. Easterners still adhere to God's commandment not to add or to omit a word from the scriptures. So all your modern translations, if they have been added to or bits and pieces have been left out uh, accidentally or more intently um, intentionally well you're in for big trouble there buddy yeah because God apparently said in the scriptures even Christ said uh, not one jot or tittle from the law not one word uh, jot or tittle from the word of God will change it should be um, omitted you can't add it to add to it, right? Even the prophecies of Revelation, because then you get um, the wrath of God upon you, all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, 
Your Easterners still adhere to God's commandment not to add or to omit a word from the Scriptures. The Holy Scripture condemns any additional subtraction or modification of the Word of God. So if you're out there, Hebrew Israelites, and you're making words up like Yahu Wahu Wahu, Yahu Washi Washi, and all this sort of stuff, and it's not in the Hebrew, it's not in the Aramaic, oh my gosh, cut it out. Because okay. we have consulted with a professional, um, he has the two PhDs, the doctorates, in both the Aramaic and the Hebrew, not too sure about the Greek, but he went presented those words Yahoo washi washi yaha woo 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 whatever um, as names of God he said what the hell is that rubbish it's not even Hebrew it's not in the Hebrew it's not so much attack on you personally as a person it's on the attack and defense of what you claim which is false yeah and it was uh when we heard it, it was coming from a woman but we have heard it from um, you know looking at the videos of the people preaching on the street um, the holy scripture condemns any additional subtraction or modification of the word of God and that's why those Syrians ancient Syrians up to this very day have not messed with it so we through this uh Aramaic speaking translator from Bet Naren or Mesopotamia, Syria. Uh, if those are the unchanged, if those were his translations were the original ancient, very old manuscripts in that language, that very old language, they never been never been messed with, and they are translated by him in the nearest English equivalent, while staying faithful to what those scriptures actually say. Then an answer to someone saying oh well then your um, scriptures are superior are they yeah well in a way they are because they have been messed with like your Americanized English versions right breaking that command there not to add to the commandments or not to add to the words you know, of God and you should never take from it but you must keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you Deuteronomy 40 everything that I commend you that you be careful to do you shall not add or take from it Deuteronomy 12.32 do not add to his words lest he reprove you and you be found a liar okay Proverbs 36 there it is in a nutshell okay so you're adding to it taking it away translating it wrong teaching that wrong to people you are a liar yeah, anyone out there we're not just picking on the one but we're telling all of you right and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy or any of those prophecies especially revelations God shall take away his portion from the tree of life eternity right eternal life and from the holy city that's that that'll be the new city uh, the new Jerusalem comes down from the kingdom of God etc and from the things which are written in this book yeah, the book of revelations yeah, probably including the entire collection of books and that's from Revelations 22.19 look it up it is also true of the Jews and Muslims that they should they would not dare to alter a word of the Torah or Quran Easterners are afraid that they may incur the curse if they make a change in the word of God so that's why they don't do it but a lot of these Islam Imams are making up stuff saying oh yeah uh, Muhammad is mentioned in the ancient Aramaic, etc., um, etc. Et the Holy Spirit, which says the Holy Spirit uh, would be sent as a comforter or given to those disciples. Like Christ said, he'll send another. He wasn't talking about Muhammad, or that another would come after him as a prophet, and his name is Ahmed, or anything like that. That's a load of rubbish. Yeah. We have evidence, we have proven that that's a load of rubbish. It's not there. Do not add to his words lest he reprove you, and you are, you be found a liar, or he exposes you, right? He has you scolded, okay, and you are deemed and found to be a liar, Proverbs 30, verse 6. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his portion from the tree of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book, Revelation 22, 19. 
It's also true of the Jews and Muslims that they would not dare to alter a word of the Torah or Quran. Easterners are afraid that they may incur the curse if they make a change in the word of God. So that's why they don't do it. They've never done it. Some of these ancient manuscripts go back to the 5th century AD. The oldest dated biblical manuscript in the world is that of the four books of Moses, 464 AD, which now lies in the British Museum. Another one is the Codex Ambrosianus. That sounds like Latin. Yeah. Okay, anyway. So some of it goes back to the 7th century, some of it to the 5th century, and some of it might be earlier. This codex is not the work of one man. Apparently some portions were written before the vowel system was invented. So the vowel system was invented. Okay. Uh, people who speak or practice Hebrew, etc., etc., claim they know Hebrew, um, might add to YWH or YHWH the A, the E, etc. to get Yahweh or Yahuwah or whatever okay, when it originally wasn't there it was added, it was invented by a certain sect, probably the Masorites okay. supposedly so others can pronounce it when they're learning it the Hebrew they can pronounce it properly all that sort of stuff um, so with those vowels added it made a difference a great change between the ancient Aramaic and the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew, the original ancient very old Aramaic and the ancient, the original ancient very old Hebrew because way back originally they had the same words with the same meanings but when this vowel system was added not only changed the structure of the words of the language and the words but also changed the meaning so for example, in the Aramaic, you have Elohim, E L O H W E M, versus the Hebrew Elohim, E L O H I M. Elohim uh, over the flames in the original ancient, very old Aramaic language, and Elohim possibly referring to the God, El or Him, the God or the gods, but more probably more referring to El, the God. Yeah, and El, if you look it up. It's the Canaanite God. When Abraham entered into Canaan, the promised land, the Canaanites and others were still there speaking their language and doing their pagan practices and one of their gods was El and Baal. Or Baal. Google it. The Pentateuch of the British Museum must have been written before the vowel system was invented. Aramaic documents of the 5th century and later used the vowel system, some of them fully and some in part, because yeah, in the original ancient Aramaic, the only vowel, which wasn't actually a vowel, was A. So we've heard read. Okay. They mainly used consonants, mainly had consonants. It is interesting to know that this vowel system was adopted by the Jews, so it's taken on board by the Jews, and was begun about the 5th century AD. In some portions of the above text, the old Aramaic original consonantal spelling without apparatus of vowel points is well preserved. This is also true of some of the New Testament texts in the Pierpont Morgan Library, New York City, USA. Unfortunately, many ancient and valuable Aramaic texts were lost during World War I. But printed copies of them, carefully made by American missionaries under the help and guidance of competent native scholars, are available. Yeah, I'd be careful of these ones if it's done by these American missionaries uh, in Urmia uh, in the 1900s, okay, where they tried to create a Syriac grammar to translate the King James Version into the Syriac and then preach it to those Syrians there. Yeah, I'd if that's the same one, I'd be careful of that because according to the translated victim in Alexander, they botched it. Moreover, the number of ancient New Testament texts, some of them going back to the 5th century AD, are in various libraries. The New Testament text is the Pierpont Morgan Library, and the Pierpont Morgan Library are among the oldest in existence. Okay. The translator of this work has access to the existing text. He has spent many years comparing them in the course of translating the Bible. So he might have done his homework. 
Astonishingly enough, all the Peshitta texts in Aramaic agree. There is one thing of which the Eastern scribes can boast. They copied the holy books diligently, faithfully and meticulously. Sir Frederick Kenyon, curator of the British Museum, in his book Textual Criticism of the New Testament, speaks highly of the accuracy of copying and of the antiquity of Peshitta MSS or manuscripts. The versions translated from the Semitic languages into Egypt uh, the versions translated from Semitic languages into Greek and Latin were subject to constant revisions. Learned men who copied them introduced changes, trying to simplify obscurities and ambiguities which were due to the work of the first translators. Present translators and Bible revisers do the same when translating the Bible, treaties and documents from one language to another. The American Constitution, written in English, will always remain the same when new copies are made, but translations into other languages will be subject to revision. Fair enough. Therefore, a copy of the United States Constitution published 10 years ago is far more valuable than a translation made 200 years ago. Translations are always subject to revisions and disputes over exact meaning because words and terms of speech in one language cannot be translated easily into another without loss. This is one reason why we have so many translations and revisions of the King James Version. As said before, Aramaic was the language of Semitic culture, the language of the Hebrew patriarchs, and in the older days, the lingua franca, or trendy language of the Fertile Crescent. The term Hebrew is derived... Okay, just a warning there to all people out there. Okay, uh, there's scammers... Um, on line on websites that make out they ring you that somehow they find your number maybe someone on sells them to, to them whatever right pass on your information and then um, they ring you uh, might be a 61 number 64 number or 44 number or whatever it's a um, bitcoin trading scam yeah they won't tell you yes what's this website they say oh you joined up you know you, you wanted to know more about an offer all that sort of stuff you gave us your name and details somehow they get that right and they say oh yeah um all this stuff about whatever the offer is right just pay 250 deposit and then they'll set you up with a password and all this sort of stuff right you ask for the um website and all that sort of stuff and they um won't give it to you they'll throw you off sent right all this sort of stuff we talk to them for about an hour and they just keep ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing and somehow they us being in New Zealand they have a 9 number they're ringing from a 09 so we're thinking how the hell are they doing that system right okay so you get fooled and you think oh it's someone that knows you um, ringing you to say hey how you doing you know, but it's them so, it's, I don't know how they do it Right, but it comes up at 0988 or something number like that right so be very careful so as you heard they were interrupting us mid video yeah we know it's uh, not um, certain uh, establishments that we, we're supposed to be talking with right because they don't ring you at 9 o'clock at night they're usually closed about 5 or 6 in the afternoon right so these slimes you have to watch out for because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get your credit card saying to you make a instant payment deposit to us or let us take it out and then we'll set up your um, trading account and give you the details through email all that sort of stuff you do that you lost your money no information sent to your email that you've given them and then you try to get hold of them you can't because of, you know, there's, you're here and there in say uh, China or something like that right uh, Europe somewhere and they won't answer your emails. So be very careful of them. Avoid those trading things, the stockbroker things, unless you know, or you you got into one and it's all legit. They say, oh, there's this, I don't know what it's called, FDC or something, some sort of law that says you can't do that, or this sort of stuff, right? But that's a load of crap. They're just using it as a backup. The, the trick is that you realize that they're a scammer is when you ask them, okay, they say you signed up, you want or you wanted some more information, contact us or whatever, and you wanted some more information on this opportunity, right? She says, oh, how long ago? Uh, t uh, about a week ago. Uh, brr, lies, because I haven't done that, signed up for anything for like 
at least six months to a year. They got your details of your email or whatever, right? Okay. Um, and then they keep saying, you did, you did, you did. It says, no, no, no way. Uh, if you have a witness, right? Someone in your household that says, no, he doesn't do that anymore. Yeah. They keep insisting that you did. And then they keep trying to tell you, oh, give us your account number, right? Your bank account number. And um, we'll take out 250 and then set up this thing for you. All that stuff we get a hold of you. The email, that's a crap, and you can get in there, we'll take you through it, or a broker will take you through it, or whatever, right? Don't believe that crap, it's all crap, okay? Unless you have someone, as we said, if you have someone that knows exactly um, how to do it, right? They've been through it, they haven't got ripped off or anything like that, and they're making money. Those are the only people you can really trust. You have to have a friend like that that does it. I wouldn't trust anyone that's on the other side of, other side of your phone call, right? So yeah, be careful. So yeah, they interrupted us, but that's just a fair warning there, because they keep ringing us. They ring us about probably another hour or so. Or they, because we talked to them for a while, then we just said, "Oh look, I'm gonna go to toilet." And I, I just, you know, I can't hold on to it anymore. So yeah, they hang up, right? But then somebody else rings you with a six four six one forty four number straight away, right? That sort of thing. They just keep pestering, pestering you all the time. So we're probably um, have another cell phone number right where we know that it's family that's ringing us okay or certain government departments that we've got to keep in contact with right be it the tax department or whatever so we know specifically if someone's given that number out right okay we won't use it online but if amazingly it ends up online right and then they start ringing us these same scammers, they would know that somebody out there, through a phone company or whatever, or someone you've met on the street, then they say, oh, you only want to sign up, uh, vote or something like that, right? right? They'll pass on that, on sold that information. Yeah? So yeah, it's just a fair warning there. Watch out for these scammers. They keep ringing you, keep ringing you, keep ringing you, right? And trying to tell you, if you answer, um, that you signed up for the offer a week ago when you didn't oh yes you did oh no I didn't oh yes you did it's like uh, so did you know what I have for breakfast this morning you know some sort of example like that yeah oh, no, this is something off the top of my head you know um, can you verify that I had breakfast this morning that sort of thing right okay so we're going to go back to this Ooh, let off the steam there. Okay, where were we? Um, okay, so it's basically going on about the Aramaic Peshitta. And the Aramaic Peshitta text, the term Peshitta means straight, simple, sincere, and true. That is the original. This name was given to the ancient and authoritative text to distinguish it from other Bible revisions and translations which were introduced into some of the churches of the East. Monophysites after the division at Ephesus and Chalcedon in 431 and 441 respectively. This ancient Peshitta is still the only authoritative text of the Old and New Testament of all Eastern Christians in the, in the Near East and India, the Church of the East, the Roman Catholic Church in the East, the Monophysites and Indian Christians. This is because this text was in use for 400 years before the Christian Church was divided into several sects. Okay, so what about the uh, ancient Galilean Aramaic manuscripts handed over by Thomas, the disciple Thomas, to the priest of that church of the East. These are in the Galilean Aramaic, um, not the Syriac. This is the original ancient El, uh, Galilean Aramaic that Christ and his disciples spoke, not the Syriac. What about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. The Peshitta. Old Testament contains what is known as the Book of the Apocrypha. As the books of the Apocrypha, which have been handed down in the Peshitta manuscripts together with the Book of the Law and the Book of Books of the Prophets. And since these ap apocryphal books are included in the text, they are only looked upon as a sacred literature, even though they are not as commonly used as the others. Okay, so that's not the Roman Catholic Apocrypha, is it? Because if it is, I'd be very careful with that one. Yeah, I think it might be talking about the um, End Times um, Apocrypha, right? The Apocalypse-related texts. 
that's probably what it's talking about apocryphal yeah I think that might be the difference there the Peshitta canon was set before the discovery of these books uh, what's it say there Moreover, this ancient New Testament text omits the story of the woman taken in adultery, 2 Peter 2, and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. But these books are included in later Aramaic texts. The Peshitta canon was set before the discovery of these books. Okay, okay, so that's why uh, Andrew Gabriel Roth on his website doesn't have the book of Revelation. Aha, uh -huh. so now we understand why. Amid persecutions, the ancient church of the East, through God's help and protection was able to keep these sacred writings <clears throat> of the old and new testaments in the biblical lands in Persia and India just as the Roman Catholic Church preserved them in order uh, them in the West. Christianity also owes a debt to the Jewish people who preserved the word of God amid persecution and suffering. Yeah, uh, apparently 18 centuries of um, being called heretics persecuted killed off, martyred and so forth Therefore, Peshitta should not be confused with the 5th century Bible revisions in Aramaic and new versions which were made from Greek. So that would be the Western Peshitto. None of these new revisions and versions made by the Monophysite bishops in the 5th century has ever been accepted by the Church of the East. Moreover, these bishops who left their church and joined the Greek Church and produced these versions for theological reasons so that their doctrine might agree with the doctrine of the Byzantine Church, which was the powerful imperial sect, were expelled by the Patriarch of the East and their works were condemned. However, in some provinces, owing to the pressure exerted by the Byzantine emperors, these new revisions were introduced, but when the territory was occupied by the Persian government, they were destroyed. Had the Peshitta been made by order of one of the rival churches, the others would, accept, would have rejected it. But since all Christians, even the Muslims, in the Middle East accept and revere the Peshitta text, it proves beyond a doubt that it was in use many centuries before the division of the church. The originality of the Peshitta text is strongly supported by early evidence. Ephraates quoted it, St. Ephraim wrote a commentary on it, and the doctrine of Adai or Adi placed it at the Apostolic Times. According to the Peshitta text, the Semitic names of people and towns and localities in both the New and Old Testaments agree. The names which end with S are retained for the Western reader. In the Peshitta text, Barnabas is Barnaba, Abbas is Abba, Peter is Kepa. Then again, some of the names of localities are different, but older than those in other texts. For example, Rakim is used instead of Kadesh, Mathnin instead of Bashan, Amora for Gomorrah, or Gomorrah. The error in this instance is due to close similarity between Gamal and Ain. And Gamal, as we know, is either in the Syriac as camel or the rope, now the rope that they used to moor their boats, and Ain. A town near the city of Gomorrah is called Amoriah. No doubt the pre exile Hebrew texts used these older names. The late Ma Jacob, or Jacob, Eugene Manna, Chaldean Roman Catholic. Metropolitan of Armenia, a distinguished Aramaic scholar whose writings are in the Aramaic, says that the text which is called Peshitta is without dispute even earlier than the writings which came down from the works of Bar Dasan, who was living in the latter part of the 2nd century. He also states that the Aramaic speech in Mesopotamia was richer and purer than the Aramaic speech of other regions. It was the richness, richness and the beauty of this language which was used as the lingua franca, or the Trinity language, by the three great empires in the Near East and Middle East, which enriched the English language. The Greek and Latin translators made literal translations of the scriptures, keeping the Semitic rhythm and sentence structure. Indeed, the translations of the scriptures into the English language facilitated the work of later English writers. The style of Shakespeare, Milton and Browning could not have been what is without the beauty of the King James translation, which was inherited from Semitic languages. This is true of all of the language into, languages into which the Bible has been translated. The Septuagint is based on early Hebrew manuscripts and not on the later ones known as the Masoretic, which were made in the 6th to the 9th centuries. In other words, there are many similarities between the Septuagint and the Peshitta text, but the former contains inevitable mistranslations, which are due to difficulties in transmitting Hebrew or Aramaic 
thought and mannerisms of speech into a totally alien tongue like Greek. But as has been said, such was not the case between Biblical Aramaic and Biblical Hebrew, which are of the same origin. Josephus used Aramaic and Hebrew words indiscriminately, thus the term translating from Hebrew to, into Aramaic or, view, or vice versa is incorrect. It would be like one stating as having translated the United States Constitution from the Pens Pennsylvania language into the English language or from Lower German to Higher German. Even before the first captivity, 721 BC, Jewish kings, scribes and learned men understood Aramaic, 2 Kings 1826. The Israelites never wrote their sacred literature in any language but Aramaic and Hebrew, which are sister languages. There you go. The Septuagint was made in the 3rd century BC for the Ex Alexandrian Jews. Yeah, that's Greek Jews. This version was never officially read by the Jews in Palestine who spoke Aramaic and read Hebrew. Instead, the Jewish authorities condemned the work and declared a period of mourning because of the defects in the version. Evidently, Jesus and his disciples used a text which came from an older Hebrew original, supposedly. This is apparently because Jesus' quotations from the Old Testament agree with the Peshitta text, but do not agree with the Greek text. There you go again. For example, in John 12.40, the Peshitta Old Testament and New Testament agree. This is not all. Jesus and his disciples not only could not converse in Greek, but they never heard it spoken. So all those out there says Jesus spoke... Jesus and the disciples spoke Greek, are all baloney, faloney, and they're liars, right? Okay? Boom, boom, boom. We believe that the scriptures were conceived and inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by Hebrew prophets who spoke and wrote as the Holy Spirit moved them. Okay, some of those Jews, uh, they went to Damascus, etc., which was populated by Greeks and others. That was the main language there. They tried to learn it, but they found it was so damn difficult. Yeah. You know? Only learned men could do that anyway. Yeah, they found it hard. So they used the Aramaic or the Hebrew. But the Greeks wanted everything in Greek because they wanted everything to be very Greeky so they could say, oh, yeah, it came from us. That sort of idea, right? Okay. Again, the Israelites never wrote the sacred literature in any language but Aramaic and Hebrew, which are sister languages. The Septuagint, the LXX, was made in the 3rd century BC for the Alexandrian Jews, Greek Jews, or Jews that were living there, right, in Alexandria. This version was never officially read by the Jews in Palestine, who spoke Aramaic and read Hebrew. Instead, the Jewish authorities condemned the work and declared a period of mourning because of the defects in the version, probably in that... Um, Septuagint LXX, right? Evidently, Jesus and his disciples used a text which came from an older Hebrew original. This is apparent because Jesus' quotations from the Old Text and Testament agree with the Peshitta text, but do not agree with the Greek text. For example, in John 12:40, the Peshitta Old Testament and New Testament agree. This is not all. Jesus and his disciples not only could not converse in Greek, but they never heard it spoken. Da 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 da. da. So all you out there saying they did? You're a bunch of liars, right? You're being exposed. We believe that this, these translators or publishers believe that these scriptures were conceived and inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by Hebrew prophets who spoke and wrote as the Holy Spirit moved them to the people in their days using idioms. It's a form of expression, getting it across right, Eastern expression, similes, parables, and metaphors in order to convey their messages. Moreover, these men of God sacrificed their lives that the word of God might live. The Jewish race treated these sacred writings as a priceless possession. That's why when uh, there was a threat, they'd gather them up, right? They'd hide them for years or whatever. They'd hide them and read them now and again, or whenever. And then when they're threatened, right? Oh, gather up with stuff, gather those sacred texts and run, right? That's why they were preserved. Because of the sacrifice, to, you know, they held these as so sacred you know don't let it fall into the wrong hands writing was prevalent from the earliest days the Israelites made more extensive use of the instrument of writing than neighbouring nations such as the Ammonites Moabites and other kindred people around about them 
Yeah, they're probably too busy drinking and feasting, right? And, and the mass orgies. Moses wrote the Ten Commandments. Joshua wrote on an altar which he built west of Jordan. The Israelites were minus to fasten the commandments to their foreheads and necks and to write them on their doorsteps. Everything was written at the time it was revealed, God said to Moses. Now there, for write this song for them and teach it to the children of Israel and put it into their mouths. This song will be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Or in regards to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 31, 19. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets, which he who reads it may understand it clearly. Habakkuk 2, 2. That's the Old Testament scriptures we've written very early. Yeah, so tablets, they probably decide to write on skins easy to carry tablets might get broken yeah. or your wife their wife might use it as breadboard or something like that yeah so yeah imagine trying to carry 613 tablets damn hard easy to carry um, skins or parchment right? this is also true of the gospels they were written a few years after the resurrection and some of the portions were written by Matthew while Jesus was preaching they were not handed down orally and then written after the Pauline epistle, epistles. As some Western scholars say, they were written many years before these epistles. Other contemporary Jewish literature was produced at the same time the Gospels were in circulation. So, it's saying here they were not handed down orally, like from mouth to mouth over the centuries. Okay, these Gospels, and then written after the Pauline epistles, as some Western scholars say, okay, according to Lamsa. They were written many years before these those epistles. Other contemporary Jewish literature was produced at the same time the Gospels were in circulation. Because how could you remember word for word everything, right? It's illogical. It goes against everything that's common sense, right? You'd have to remember every word. So if you had, like, one guy who wasn't paying attention, he might get a word wrong, right? He might not say the exact words, right? And he pass on the exact words. And then that person may not pass on the exact words. Ever heard of Chinese whispers? Okay, uh, the Gospels as well as the Epistles were written in Aramaic, the language of the Jewish people, both in Palestine and in the Greco-Roman Empire. Greek was never the language of Palestine. Josephus' book on the Jewish wars was written in Aramaic. Josephus states that even though a number of Jews had tried to learn the language of the Greeks, hardly any of them succeeded. Yeah, because it was damn difficult for them, right? As we stated earlier. Like, what the hell? We can't get our heads around this. Josephus wrote, 42 AD, I have also taken a great deal of pains to obtain the learning of the Greeks. He probably learnt the language of the Greeks. And understand the elements of the Greek language. Although I have so accustomed myself to speak our own tongue that I cannot pronounce Greek with sufficient exactness. So he wasn't that great at it. For our nation does not encourage those that learn the language of many nations. On this account, as there have been many who have done the endeavours with great patience to obtain this Greek learning, there have yet hardly been two or three that have succeeded herein, who were immediately rewarded for their pains, and that's from his Antiquities 20, 21 too. Instead, the teaching of Greek was forbidden by Jewish rabbis. It was said that it was better for a man to give his child meat of swine than to teach him the language of the Greeks, because they're um, Gentiles. They're non-Jews, they're foreigners. That's probably what they're getting at. When the King James translation was made, Western scholars had no access to the East, as we have today. In the 16th century AD, the Turkish Empire had extended its borders as far as Vienna. So this King James, as we found quite a while back, actually had, they had the Puritan Bible, which he detested. He didn't like it. So he says, oh, we want a new English Bible, right? For us and the people. We don't like the Puritan Bible etc etc okay we'll um boot out the Roman Catholics all that sort of stuff right and we'll establish the Church of England okay and so he gathered a team together to translate from this Puritan Bible possibly and created a new Bible version in 1611 the King James Version which was very Shakespeare speak When the King James translation was made, Western scholars had no access to the East. So, how did they translate the original Aramaic or Hebrew or Koine Greek? Well, okay, let's just say the um, original ancient 
Aramaic and the ancient, the original ancient Hebrew. How do they translate that if they had no access to the East? Okay, think about that one. So in the front of your Bibles, your modern Bibles, be it NIV, etc., etc., it says that they translated from the original Aramaic and the original Hebrew. Okay. Uh, or if they trans just rephrase it, if they translated the King James Version from the original Aramaic, the original ancient, very old Aramaic, the Shana Atika Sapraya, Tal Ashrit, and the original ancient, very old original Hebrew, the Tab Ivri or Avri or Hotib. Um, how could they do that if they had no access? to the east okay think about that one okay so again when the King James translation was made Western scholars had no access to the east as we have today in the 16th century AD the Turkish Empire had extended its borders as far as you know okay so then they didn't have access to the east and then later on after 16th century etc they may have had access to it as we do today Okay, but looking at those introductions in these modern Bible versions, and they say, "Oh, we translated from the original Aramaic, or the original Hebrew, or the original Koine Greek." Well, again, we'll go back to just using referring to the uh, original ancient, um, very old Aramaic, Tav Asher, etc., and the original ancient, very old Hebrew. Okay, those would be long dead old tongues unused nobody uses them anymore as no one uses old latin old germanic uh norse old norse etc right unless you had a way to if you had access to original ancient very old manuscripts as victor and alexander did even though in bible format um and you found a way to translate them using the modern or vernacular root words to do so okay so very suspicious of that one they probably have the modern syriac the modern hebrew and modern greek yeah. uh, one european country after another was falling under the impact of the valiant turkish army europe was almost conquered this is not it this is not all the reformations and controversies in the Western Church had destroyed Christian Christian unity. Moreover, the scriptures in Aramaic were unknown in Europe. So there you go. So how could they, at that time, have translated from the original Aramaic? Uh -huh. The only recourse scholars had was to Latin into a few portions of Greek manuscripts. This is certainly uh, this is clearly seen from the works of Erasmus. Besides, the knowledge of Greek was almost lost at this time, and Christians were just emerging from the Dark Ages. Yeah, it's probably uh, the Koine Greek, okay, or the Attica Greek. Not too sure on that one. Many people have asked why the King James translators did not use the preceded text from Aramaic on with scriptures used in the East. Well, they did. Supposedly, they did later on, way after, right? The answer is that's the way you've got these modern versions that claim it. The answer is there were no context between east and west until after the conquest of india by great britain in the rise of the imperial imperial power of britain in the near east middle east and the far east it is a miracle that the king james translators were able to produce such a remarkable translation from sources available in this dark period of european history yeah if they had no access and it was not known etc how the hell did they do it every 50 years ago or even 50 years ago the knowledge of western scholars relative to the eastern scriptures in Aramaic and the Christian church in the east was conjectural which that saying is all hearsay moreover these scholars knew very little of the eastern customs and manners in which the biblical literature was nurtured thank God today new discoveries have been made new facts have come to light new democratic institutions and governments have long have been established have been established in the east what in the 16th and 17th centuries was viewed at a long distance now can be seen face to face yeah today it's very different today not only scholars ministers and bible teachers walk on palestinian soil but also thousands of men and women visit biblical lands every year for centuries translations from semitic languages have been subject to revision 
they are now they are even now subject to revision this is why there are so many bible versions varying each from the other let us just take one instance which the publisher considers very important in the King James Version we read in Numbers 25 4 and the Lord said unto Moses take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel the Aramaic reads and the Lord said to Moses take all the chiefs of the people and expose them before the Lord in the daylight that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from the children of Israel see the difference there you may think oh they chopped their heads off yeah hang them in the sun yeah like something off the walking dead right some noted Greek scholars in recent translations have changed the word hang to execute but this is not what the original writer said God could not have told Moses to behead or execute all Israelites the Lord was angry at the princes of Israel because of the sin of Baal Peor they had been lax or lazy in enforcing the law or slack and also guilty in joining the sensual Baal worship. And in 1 Corinthians 7, 36 and 38, King James, we read, But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and needs so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in my marriage, not in marriage doeth better. Okay, that's the Shakespeare speak there the Aramaic reads if any man thinks that he is shamed by the behavior of his virgin daughter because she has passed the marriage age and he has not given her a marriage and that he should give her let him do what he will and he does not sin let her be married so then he who gives his virgin daughter a marriage does well and he who does not give his virgin daughter a marriage does even better some of the scholars use betrothed or betrothed instead of virgin daughter the American Standard Version of 1990, uh, 1901, correctly used the term virgin daughter. Certainly the King James translators would have known the difference between <coughs> virgin daughter and betrothed or betrothed. Paul, in this instance, is referring to a virgin's vow, Numbers 30, 16. These discrepancies between various versions have been the cause of contentions and divisions among sincere men and women who are earnestly seeking to understand the word of God. At times they do not know what to believe and what not to believe. They cannot understand why the scripture in one place says, love your father and mother, and in another place admonishes, hate your father and mother. Moreover, they are bewildered when told that Jesus on the cross cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The King James says in John 16:32, behold, your hour cometh, yea, year is now come that ye shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Then again the Old Testament in many instances states that God does not forsake the righteous nor those who trust in him. Jesus was the Son of God and entrusted his spirit to God. Jesus could not have contradicted himself. Okay? The Peshitta text reads, My God, my God, for this I was speed. That's in the Peshitta. The Syriac Peshitta, right? You can have a look at... Um, Andrew Gabriel Roth's translation of that Eastern Syriac Peshitta to see if it actually says that there in the English it has the Syriac fonts so you can um, find the words as well so you can if you wanted to you can learn uh, the Syriac in the Galilean Aramaic translated translation the original hidden and preserved translated by the Aramaic the native Aramaic speaking translator Victor Alexander he uh, we covered this many times he actually translates it into the nearest English equivalent from the Galilean Aramaic into English and he makes the note that Christ didn't yell uh, or bellow from that cross my God my God why have you forsaken me that it's a second or third um, Greek Arabic transliteration it's incorrect he words it differently he says um why have wherefore which indicates um something about why he was created um his purpose right they're supposed to fulfill why has he been left there um how do i put it 
why has he been left hanging there is it in order to fulfill what he was destined yeah it's like wherefore have you destined me indicating that he was put up there we went through that to fulfill God's will okay he's the only one who could do it um, to die for this to be um, mistreated etc and his blood shed and that blood would um, be shed for the sins of all men right it's because there was no way back to God only through him okay so he was that way back etc etc we may uh, put that particular video that we made which verifies that on the end of this video as an end screen okay um, yeah so he's verifying that those Americanized English translations are actually wrong way off so people out there who are teaching that this is what Christ said right in the Aramaic or the Hebrew are actually lying through their teeth sometimes they don't realize it sometimes they know it when you produce it to them say no no according to the original manuscripts that's not what he said right and they say oh but my NIV says this yeah well that's your later Americanized English version isn't it which is which we just proved uh, with the original um, Aramaic from the 1st 2nd century right compared to your 1611 version or your 1956 or 66 67 version translated English is wrong but they still want to argue with you you know even though you prov provide them with all the established facts the evidence that's proven itself evident uh, etc etc okay because that's the way they've been programmed yeah. from their cult their group their movement their church denomination whatever right? yeah. they strongly believe that what the, they've got in front of them is the truth even though you provide the evidence sorry bro it's an, you're in error they still want to argue with you because they've been exposed what, what does man dislike being told that he's wrong okay you can get all uppity okay so that there verifies what Victor E. Alexander the Aramaic translator was saying through uh, George Lampsas testifying that these modern versions have been translated wrongly and incorrect so we could say in a sense yeah we will um, that these people out there say oh God's a nasty murderer and all this sort of stuff right he had these people killed and those people killed and all that sort of stuff well it's possibly you're reading from that you're trying to find something to put on Christians right to down them trot on them trot on their belief system whatever right okay, that's your hidden motive or whatever you know or uh, you just are reading or memorizing uh, recalling the Americanized Bible version that you've been you've read or th thought you've read um, like some people they read a little bit say like this page here and they think oh, I've read the whole Bible I know it better than you when they haven't even read it you know read it in its entirety or whatever studied it done the research or this sort of stuff right um, yeah so they come at you with, oh yeah guys mean he did this to all these babies and all this sort of stuff right but they don't bother to again they don't bother to study it research it right and fully understand what it's actually saying like we can say in an instant well okay there's those accounts where say just for example the Kushites or the Moabites or whoever right they're sinning against God and all this sort of stuff doing all their nasty things if they were so God said right, you got to wake them all out so Moses or whoever goes in there with his army or whatever is gathering and he kills them all off right rock smashing you know, all that sort of stuff um, you know all in that detail we don't want to go into that because it might upset some people right um, all that sort of stuff right so they come at you and they say all that sort of crap but they don't understand they were warned by God to change their ways to repent you know come back to God or turn to God or whatever but they were stiff necked people right and they want to do their own thing and all that sort of stuff so they snubbed them and just stuck their finger up in this you know, gave them the bird whatever Okay, so he tells him, warns him a couple of times, maybe three times or more. He sends a prophet, they kill off that prophet. So he sends another one, they kill that one, right? So he's like, had enough, that's it. Okay, 
you've been told and told and told and told so as children you'll be punished yeah, so he sends in uh, Moses or whoever or Abraham and a certain land was given to him and it was all supposed to be for them you know holy nation all that sort of stuff so you got to do a cleansing of all these sinners idol worshippers and all that sort of stuff so they don't have any distractions because the problem with these house of Israel is sometimes they're in there being all holy righteous toward God and they'd look to the left or the right or whatever and they start taking on the pagan peoples of that land's religion customs um, pagan worship all that sort of stuff so they get told by God repent repent turn back to me or else you're going to get punished so they don't so they get punished put it to slavery or you know, whatever whatever right? that sort of thing yeah. we'll get wiped out or whatever have a look at the book of Exodus yeah? people that went and broke his commandments after they were told don't do that don't do this don't do that and they did it so they got punished for it yeah? because he had to purge that nation of all those sinners all those potential sinners his temptations and all that so they could be that his holy this chosen holy nation of which eventually the manifestation of God or Jesus the Messiah the Christ would come through okay they were his chosen his first chosen they were the ones to be the holy righteous um, pure nation yeah under him okay so we'll stop there we'll give it a break Okay, we're still bugged by the mysterious phone call scammer and a couple of other things in here where people have said one thing and we've proven again and again and again that these people out there are false, that they're lying through their teeth, they're teaching people um, errors, uh, false translations, claiming it to all be the truth. Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed this. You found it very interesting, very eye-opening. If you did, give us a like. Add your comments below the uh, video here. Don't forget to subscribe to us. Yeah, subscribe to us. Give us a like. Add your comments below. We'll get back to you on those as soon as we can, when we can. And then go share this video with all your family, friends, neighbors, etc. Christian friends, Jewish friends, Islamic friends. To tell them, hey man, these organized religions from day dot. And these people that are pumping out this. Bible stuff on the street are actually lying to you. They've got the incorrect translations. This guy's saying this is in the Aramaic, whatever, your imams or whatever, and it's not there. Okay? Because the ministry of the real truth, who brings you the real truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, no fluff, no hype, no BS, is actually providing that, right? That evidence that, that of established facts, etc., etc. So you can wake up and see, uh oh. We've been sucking. Oh my gosh, they're taking advantage of us. They've been fooling us. They've been lying to us. Oh my gosh. Why wasn't there somebody out there like this telling us the real truth, the whole truth? Okay, because we're truth seekers and we wanted the real truth. Why did you, why do you people come out and preach to us saying you have the truth when you actually don't? You know, 